Hey, good morning, Duxbury Church, Duxbury Virtual Church. Pastor Tim here. Uh, good to connect with you this morning digitally. I hope you can um, just tune in and share this. I would encourage you just to, to begin to share this online, different platforms. Really appreciate you. Appreciate the prayer and support. We've missed you guys um, traveling the last couple of weeks and getting some downtime and, and some good family time. But glad to be back in the saddle, as it were, uh, just to connect with you. But uh, hey, good morning. Good morning. How are you guys? We're so glad that you've joined us. If you're new joining us, if this is one of your first times, welcome. Please send us a private message or leave a comment in the comment section. We'd love to reach out to you, see if there's any way that we can serve you, um, and just see if, if we can help you in any way. And if you are having any kind of financial need or spiritual need or just any kind of need, please reach out to us as well. We have teams ready to serve as well as people who've been giving over and above to help with financial needs. Um, we've been able to help some. We'd love to continue to help more. I know that we can't help everyone, but we want to help in ways that we can. So please reach out. We would love to um, just kind of reach out to you and serve you in that way. Um, we have a quick announcement for you about small groups. We're excited. We're, we're creating and we're getting our small groups. Some are going to meet virtually. Some are going to meet in like in person, like a social distance kind of way. Um, so if you're interested in joining your group, uh, please send us a message or you can email us at info at DuxburyChurch.org. Uh, more information will be going out in our newsletter, um, but please reach out. We'd love to give you all the information about that. We have um, leaders in place um, and groups are forming, so we would love to put you in a group. Um, small groups are just a way to stay connected, to have fellowship and friendship and to kind of go deeper together. Um, it's a great thing that we're doing. Um, I've enjoyed our being a part of our small group. Um, we're reforming new small groups, so this is a great time to jump in as new ones are forming. Um, so just, yeah, virtually and in person, you can just express which way you like would, would be most comfortable joining in. Yeah, and also wanted to highlight, so uh, we've been meeting digitally now. It's shifting back to that for the time being, and uh, yet we really value physical gatherings. And so small groups are going to be uh, kind of in smaller pockets for people to come together and have that in-person interaction uh, leading up to the time where we come back to uh, in-person services uh, and, and obviously continue with the virtual service. Uh, so definitely, I just echo what Kristen says, jump in, join a group. You will not be disappointed. We've got friendships and relationships that we've had for years from other ministries that have been birthed out of groups and fellowship and community together, serving together. So uh, join a group. It's an awesome time, kind of an onboarding window where you can uh, launch into a new group or join one that's existing that's got open doors to more jumping in. So join a group. Also want to highlight that this Wednesday, starting this Wednesday, so a couple days from now right here on our campus, we will have a social distancing prayer time, like a noonday prayer on Wednesday. So each Wednesday at noon, uh, unless there's you know power outage or something crazy, we'll meet here on the campus for uh, a time of prayer. And so we will be mindful of distancing, masks and so forth, but we really just wanna to get together as, as a, a group, those that feel comfortable and are able, uh, to spend maybe 30 to 45 minutes in prayer. We'll try not to go beyond one o'clock because some might duck in around uh, their lunchtime and have to get back into work uh, virtually, remotely, or whatever your position may be. But just a time to be together in the same space, praying, seeking God's heart together. So this Wednesday, this Wednesday, we're going to start at noon, just coming together, simply worshiping the Lord together through prayer. Uh, I won't even preach at you. I'm, I probably won't even be a lot of teaching. Uh, I might have a, a verse for us to think through or memorize or to kind of chew on, but I really just want us to huddle up and pray. And certainly our church family, we would just invite you to continue to pray for the leadership, to pray for the ministry, to pray for one another right now. Pray for our nation, pray for our region, that the gospel would continue to go out in New England, that the church would expand. And uh, we certainly want to pray for those in, in the church family right now. And uh, one sweet friend of yours and ours is, is Debbie, uh, and you know, knew who she is. We just ask that you pray for her and her family. Uh, we're going to pray now, and um, as we pray again, I want to invite you just to share this feed so we can encourage people with God's Word. Uh, today, we're going to jump back into Esther here in a moment after we pray. Uh, and I'm actually, this is uh, unusual, but I preached a message about three weeks ago that most of you didn't hear. <laughs> we had some tech issues here in-house. Uh, you could see us, but you couldn't really hear me, and I uh, felt compelled with the blessing of the board to, to kind of speak to that again. So I'm actually going to preach a message I spoke three weeks ago that you didn't hear. You may have saw some of it. But anyway, we're in Esther today, uh, the end of chapter 6 through chapter 7, uh, looking at a challenging confrontation and conversation that Esther had 
with King Xerxes. Uh, but we want to pray here briefly, and then we'll dig into God's Word back in Esther today. So you want to open us? I do. And I just want to remind you, just if you would, please just share this. Um, we would love to reach out and encourage as many people as possible. And we know that there are probably those in your Facebook social media feed that um, could, would be encouraged by this. So please just take a minute to, to share this um, and then join us as we go before God in prayer. Thank you. Jesus, Father, you are, uh, you are so good and kind and mysterious and complex and loving, Lord, but we, even in the hard days, Father, we rest in who you are, and we know that you've created us um, for good purposes. You've created good in our lives, and you love us deeply. Father, I pray for those who received just challenging, devastating news this week, Father. I pray that you would just comfort, bring peace, bring the joy that only um, you can bring, Father. Even in the midst of difficult, challenging circumstances, you are there. You promised to be with us in the middle of the storm, Father, and that no matter what, you will never leave us or forsake us. And we hold dearly and tightly to that promise, Father. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Father, we just continue to seek your heart today, and we are grateful that you, you're God, and uh, we are not Thank you for your unwavering love and your unwavering faithfulness. We thank you that you are a God that is grand and powerful and hold the universe in your hands, that you control every ripple on the sea, every wave, every changing tide is in your control. Every breath of wind that rips through the South Shore and across New England and across our land and the world is known to you and directed by you. You're a complex God, as Kristen said, a powerful, beautiful God. But beyond that, God, you're, you're personal. You're not just removed. You're not just massive and unapproachable. You desire to be known and you've made yourself known. You've revealed yourself to us through Christ the King. And you've revealed yourself to us through your word. And so, Father, in humility, we come before you today just pleading for your encouragement and your comfort, your guidance, your wisdom, your truth. Father, we lift up those that mourn today that have lost mothers and fathers and those that are wrestling with with illness and father we lift up debbie to you this morning and her entire family and ask you minister to her comfort her thank you for the legacy you've established in her thank you for the faith that she's lived well thank you for the countless lessons she's taught and modeled for her kids and the kids of this church family and the kids of this community father you've used her for eternal impact and we praise you for that We thank you for the opportunity you've given us to open your word. It's your word and uh, shape our hearts and our thinking today. Shape our lives with your word uh, from Esther today. Bless your people. Draw others to you. Encourage them today for your glory and their eternal encouragement and joy. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And so good to be with you uh, today. We're in the book of Esther, and what I'm going to talk about today, whether you follow Jesus and know him and love him and believe in him, or you're not quite sure about Christianity and what it is to follow Jesus, I think what I'm going to share for you, the kind of application that I'll get to pretty early on in the message, uh, will apply and encourage you wherever you are, whether you follow God or you, you don't believe in God. I think there's some practical application that will help you in something we all face in life pretty regularly. And so, as I think about how you've been programmed and how I've been programmed, we've been programmed, I would argue, by God for communication. God designed you and he designed me to hear from him, to know him. He's designed us to be able to communicate to him in prayer and to, to be in fellowship with him. But he's also programmed you and me for interpersonal relationships and connectivity. And so, a key part of the human experience is communication. You engage much of your day communicating, whether you realize it or think about it or acknowledge it or not. You listen to people dream about their future. You cast vision with your organization, with your family about the future and where you're going. 
You listen to people share their heart. You text and you receive text. You email, you listen, you watch, you read. We communicate regularly. We either communicate or receive it. It's a key part of who we are. God designed you to communicate. Now, you acknowledge this, that, that communication is not easy. In fact, one of the top phobias that you have, many of you have, that I have at times is a fear of speaking. Public speaking is like public enemy number one. It's this great fear that many of us have. Communication isn't easy. And there's another form of communication that is really difficult for most of us, and that is the form of communication that we might call confrontation. It's having these direct conversations with people about issues. And many of you are struggling now and, and wrestling through things in life for weeks and months because you've been afraid to have a frank, tender, difficult conversation. As I'm experiencing life and as I experience more of ministry and as I experience more of married life, I'm realizing that direct conversations, though difficult, are actually a sign of love. Because you're communicating to the other Though the subject matter may be touchy, though it may be challenging, that you care for them. And I want us to see confrontation and challenging conversations not as a bad thing, but really as a good thing that can be a catalyst for spiritual growth, a catalyst to change, a catalyst to taking us to the next level of our friendships and relationships. Some of you have unresolved business with a father, with a mother, with a spouse, with a child, with a coworker. You want to have those conversations, but it's scary. It's difficult. You don't want to be misunderstood. A leading therapist says this about confrontation and difficult conversations. This leading therapist says this, it's clear to me that a fear of confrontation is at the root of many people's distress. Workplace issues, relationship troubles, and interpersonal problems could likely be resolved if only people were able to address their concerns in an open and direct manner. I know where you're at. Some of you are thinking, man, I've been so close. Like, the moment is there. The time is right. I'm going to talk to my boss about a workplace environmental issue that's plaguing our workplace culture. I'm going to have a difficult conversation with HR, not, not to be uh, sort of a tattletale or, or to do damage, but really to, to seek the good of others, to help us improve, to make us more effective. And many of you want to address a son that's wayward now, off on his own, has his own thing going, and you just, for years now, you've been watching and you just don't know how to address it. And you've been there. You've been so close. You've had those moments where you've come together and you're like, today's the day. I'm going to have that difficult discussion with my fiance. We're going to address some things that hopefully will progress our relationship, but then you get to the moment and fear overwhelms and you begin to talk yourself out of that needed conversation. And they won't miss, they'll misunderstand me. They won't understand. I, I don't want to create waves. I don't want to stir the pot. I, I don't want to lose my job. So I'm just going to sort of swallow this and move forward. Frank conversations are biblical and it's a key aspect of the human experience within communication to have loving, direct discussions that hopefully will lead to change and growth and progression. And as we look at Esther chapter 6 verse 14 and following today, we see a seminal moment in the ministry of Queen Esther, a seminal moment that would change and better the refugees of God that were there in the Persian Empire. She had been given this plan of God during this three days of waiting. She had this three days of fasting. She sought God. She invited Mordecai, her cousin, and the other Jewish people there in Susa to three days of fasting. And it was there in the waiting, it was there in the fasting that God established the plan. God impressed upon Esther's heart 
to have this feast for her and the king and Haman, the right-hand man of Xerxes, King Ahasuerus. So the three of them came together for this sort of royal soiree. That was the plan, but in the midst of the plan, there needed to be a conversation, a confrontation that would lead to the betterment of others, that would lead to the progression of God's kingdom, that would lead to protecting the people of God. There had to be this difficult conversation in order for the plan to be fully executed, we need to see those direct challenging conversations as an opportunity from God to improve our environments, to improve our communities, to improve our families, to to mature as a church, to grow. And I'm not coming with a Pollyannish kind of attitude saying one conversation and boom, you're best friends with a buddy you haven't talked to in years. You're tight, thick as thieves with a brother you've been estranged from. I'm not saying it's going to be that easy. I'm saying that you need to have that initial conversation so that change can come, that health can come, that the elephants in the room can be exercised and done away with. So unity and purpose can flourish again. I understand that you may need a series of conversations with your spouse. You may need a series of conversations with your boss. You may need a series of conversations with your business partner to get back on track to the mission of your organization. I'm not saying it's easy, but God has positioned you as he positioned Esther for challenging talks that can restore a brother that can change the tide, turn the tide within your family, your organization, so that God may be glorified, so joy can flow, that peace can be restored once again. Many of us are harboring this fear over having these needed conversations, and it's hindering who you are, and it's filling you with angst, so that when you see somebody or talk to somebody, you're just it's just this awkwardness there. It's biblical. They're needed. And we see examples throughout Scripture. King David sinned greatly, committing adultery with Bathsheba, a man after God's own heart, like like you, like me, by the grace of God, sinned greatly, had Bathsheba's husband Uriah killed to cover up the mess, drifted off into sin, drifted from the Word of God, was even unaware of it. Nathan steps in to confront David to highlight the error of his ways so that David could be restored. The Apostle Paul in the New Testament addressed Peter, a brother in Christ, who was being hypocritical. He was living to more of the open sort of vibe of the Gentiles, which had few dietary restrictions. He was living in the ways of the Gentiles, but when certain Jewish folks were around, we see this in Galatians chapter 2, when certain folks from the kingdom of God, from the nation of Israel were around, Peter would suddenly kind of you know, sort of bow up and sort of get tight and sort of upright. Oh, yeah, practice sort of the customs of the Jewish people. Paul says, you're not applying the gospel. You're a hypocrite. How are you living like a Gentile, but inviting Gentiles to live like the people of the nation of Israel? Paul confronted his brother Peter so that restoration and healing and unity and the gospel could be applied and lived out. We come back to the Old Testament here at Esther The plan's been established of God, and now the conversation that God has placed on her heart needs to be executed. There needs to be a challenging discussion. Let's look at that conversation here, and let me real quickly just sort of capture and retell, paint the picture of where they are. So Haman, the right-hand man of Xerxes, is about to sort of just engulf Mordecai, Esther's cousin, take him down. Haman hated Mordecai because Mordecai wouldn't honor and bow and worship, in essence, Haman. Uh, And so Haman was about to get Mordecai just cut out. He just about had him in his grasp, right? And then the divine God, the sovereign God of the universe, provides a change of direction, a course change, a pivot change. The ball's going this way, and God says, "Uh -uh uh-uh-uh, divine plot twist. I'm going this way. Haman comes up grasping nothing but air, going, what in the world happened? Rather than Mordecai being taken out, Mordecai is elevated by God. The favor of God is on Mordecai as God causes the king to remember what Mordecai had done five years prior to that. 
Five years prior to that, the king was in the crosshairs of two of his eunuchs. Mordecai overheard their desire to take him down, the king down. He tells Esther, Esther tells the king and the king's people, the king is cared for, protected, and lives. Mordecai was never acknowledged, but five years later at God's appointed time, listen, some of you are serving faithfully, you're following God faithfully, you're seeking God's heart, you're doing everything the right way, by and large. We're all sinners, you're not perfect, but you hear what I'm saying. And it goes sort of unnoticed, but God knows, and in His time, maybe it's in this life or it's in the future, you will be acknowledged with the crown that you can then lay back at the feet of Christ well done my good and faithful servant there's a day coming where you'll be rewarded for your walk with the king for his grace in and through you and what he's done in and through you but in god's appointed time mordecai is exalted haman rather than taking out his enemy has to parade mordecai around susa on the king's horse with Mordecai wearing the king's robe, with the king's horse wearing one of the king's crowns. How crazy is that? That's next level stuff right there. And at the end of that, he does the walk of shame. Haman, he goes back home weeping, filled with hurt and shame and sobbing, goes to his wife, goes to his eunuchs, tells them what happened. And they just say, man, you better watch out. You were going to take out Mordecai and maybe his people, but I think you're in trouble now because something miraculous, something grand has happened here. This is a plot twist, to shift. You better watch your back. Now, it's day two of Esther's feast, God's plan, right? They're in between. It's halftime. Day one ended. Now, day two is about to start. And Haman has to go back awkwardly before the king and before Esther for this party. Have you ever been drugged to a party or brought to a party or a a gathering or something? I know gatherings are odd right now, but bear with me. Think back. Have you ever gone somewhere you didn't want to be? Have you ever been brought somewhere you didn't want to go? Yeah, me too. I got quite a few of those memories. But anyway, we'll talk about that another time. Haman was having that moment. This was the last place on earth he wanted to be. And just when he was maybe thinking, you know what, I don't have to go to day two of the party. Look what happens here. Let's look to God's word. Esther chapter six, the last verse of Esther, verse 14. While they were yet talking with him, the king's eunuchs arrived and hurried to bring Haman to the feast that Esther had prepared. You got to imagine he was just like, oh, are you kidding me? I thought they would let me off the hook now. You know, Mordecai had his thing. I did my thing. Maybe they just, but there they were time for him to face the music. They come and pick him up. Now let's look to verses 1 of chapter 7 into verse 3, and we're going to see the conversation. We're going to see Esther have this talk with the king and Haman. And I want to tell you this, just to sort of preface a bit more, to sort of establish, she didn't want to have this talk, I would imagine. I don't want to read too much in the scripture. We don't have the detail, but you've got to imagine there was a lot of fear and trepidation. She already put her life on the line when she came to the king's quarters unannounced, uninvited. And the king was wondering, what in the world do you want? Why would you risk your life? Like, what is it that you want? I'll give you half of my kingdom, Queen Esther. Just tell me what you need. So here she is again, though, addressing and having a difficult conversation with some irrational, immature, spastic men that have been heinous. I mean, Xerxes was a brutal leader, brutal to his own family, brutal to his own soldiers. I mean, this was the guy that pushed away the original queen so Esther could even be queen just did away with his original queen because she wasn't willing to do what he asked her to do. At the very least, Queen Esther knew she could be pushed away. Potentially at the worst, she could have been executed, hung like he had hung many others. This was a brutal, vile man. He didn't, she didn't know how he would respond to what she needed to say. But now let's look at the conversation and we're going to take away some things I think will help you immediately today. Not something that you just sort of Uh, in the future, but I think today can help you. Principles we can take from God's word. Whether you believe in the God of the universe or you don't, there's something here for you that will help you directly now. Like as soon as we hang up, you can go apply these things to your walk, your relationships, your interpersonal relationships. All right, let's look. Without further ado, our verse one of chapter seven. So the king and Haman went into the feast with Queen Esther. 
And on the second day, as they were drinking wine after the feast, the king again said to Esther, what is your wish, Queen Esther? He's with bated breath on pins and needles. Like, what is it that you want? He said, it should be granted to you. And what is your request? Even to the half of my kingdom, it shall be filled, fulfilled. If you want my half of my palace, if you want half of the 127 provinces, like you can have it. Like, what on earth do you need? Verse 3, here's the conversation. This is that catalytic, seminal conversation that would change the course of mankind. I'm not being dramatic. God uses this moment, works through Esther as she is a, a peacemaker, as she's someone that seeks justice, as she's someone that puts her neck on the line for the good of others, and the people of God, the children of God, the refugees of God, they're in the Persian Empire, are spared, right? So that God the Son could, in according to the Father's will, come to earth, fully God, fully man in the flesh, the incarnation of Christ through the nation of Israel. That was God's plan. And the coming of Christ, the Messiah, changes the course of history, changes your life. This is a seminal moment that comes as a result of the conversation. Look at this, verse 3. Queen Esther answered, If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it pleases the king, let my life be granted me for my wish and my people, for my request. For we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. If we have been sold merely as slaves, men and women, I would have been silent, for our affliction is not to be compared with the loss to the king. So let's look back here, verse 3. So these are the principles I'm, I'm, I want to sort of highlight that you can put in your tool belt now. Look at this. She says this. If I have found favor in your sight. Odd wording, but let me just say this uh, to summarize. She is using winsome language. She is being winsome. Like, well, what in the world's winsome? It's to come in with a tone that is respectful, tender, it's calm. She's not coming in with like bowed up, ready to throw down, toss an elbow. She's coming in with respect and a tenderness. Winsome meaning what she has to say will be received more effectively because she's not coming in to throw down. See, a lot of our confrontations and conversations go sideways off the rails because we come in all fired up, guns a blazing, and we just sort of blast people. But she comes in in a winsome, tender way. She has a difficult subject matter, but because she has a respectful, calm tone, there is more receptivity, receptivity to what she wants to say. It's, it's more likely to be heard when you come in with tenderness. You will more likely, more likely than not, gain the ear of the recipient hearing your communication. She was winsome. I think we've all been in situations where people came at us and just bludgeoned us verbally. And what happened? After 60 seconds, maybe a minute and a half, maybe two minutes, you just put up this sort of invisible wall and you're just like, bro, like back off. Or you might literally just walk away. You can't stomach it. You can't even hear it. You just feel so under attack. I've been guilty of coming in with a heavy tone and sort of raising my voice at people. I'm not immune to that. We've, I think we've all been there. We've received it. We've also been on the offensive for that type of communication. But the God of the universe calls us to a winsome tone, having difficult conversations, but doing it in a calm way. She was winsome and calm. But look at this. She didn't beat around the bush. She wasn't vague. She didn't drone on and on. Sometimes when the subject matter is difficult and you need to address something that's hard, it's easy to kind of spin your wheels and go on and on and drone and kind of beat around the bush. Look what this awesome woman does as the God of the universe moves through her winsome tone, real calm, but look back at verse 3. If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be granted me for my wish and my people for my request. Calm, winsome, clear, descriptive. She was honest. Something that could be heard, something that was direct, but it was tender. Clarity is so key in these moments. She was clear with what was needed. She goes further and de describes what has, has been plaguing her. 
Verse 5, though, we come down and the king said to Queen Esther, Who is he and where is he? Who has dared to do this? And Esther said, A foe, an enemy, the wicked Haman. Haman was terrified before the king and the queen. What we see here is Esther is an arm, an extension of God's justice. She is the light in the hands of God. She illuminates a dark, difficult circumstance. In fact, if you walk in the light of Christ, you will collide with the darkness regularly. You will collide with the darkness of your soul because we're still sinful. The Spirit will illuminate in you that you are uh, in error. You're thinking sinfully. You're speaking sinfully. You're acting sinfully. If you walk in the light of Christ, you will collide with darkness. And God's positioning you and He's positioning me to be light to illuminate injustice, to highlight things that are wrong. Some of you are the only source of light in your family. Some of you are the only source of light on the job, in your town. God's positioned you, and I know it's difficult, but he's positioned us to be an extension of his justice, to be an extension of his light and his love and his truth. And he's positioned us at times to address evil and darkness. For those of us that love the Lord, we see in Psalm 97, 10. For those that love the Lord, we're to hate evil. We should hate the injustice and evil we see in our world. And where appropriate, where appropriate, where we're positioned, we can model a different way. We can have listening ears. We can have loving speech. We can walk in the ways of Christ. We can set a different rhythm for those around us. We can live a different way according to the ways of Christ. And by doing so, we can shine the light of Christ. And when needed, which is often, there's opportunity for us to address things that are broken and wrong and sinful and dark around us for the glory of God and for the eternal well-being of those in our care and for those around us in our community. Right now, many in the, the African-American communities and uh, community, minority communities, our brothers and sisters of color are struggling and they're speaking up and they're talking about the injustices and the evils and the sins that they have faced. And sadly, I feel like the enemy right now is doing a great work and that many of the body of Christ that are Caucasian that look like me are tuning out and lending a deaf ear to the cries for help. The brothers and sisters that are loving and filled with the Spirit, God-fearing people, incredible people are crying out saying things are broken and wrong. And we're positioned, many of us, in areas of privilege and areas of leadership, uh, sort of the majority, Caucasian, I'm a young adult male that has a voice and influence and they're crying out saying, hey Tim, things have been whacked and messed up and just broken for a long time. But sadly, many are not tuning in. We're ignoring it. We're saying it's political. No, this is just overblown. This is nonsense. But when we do that, we devalue the worth of our brothers and sisters of color that are made in the image of God. Listen, if my sons or my daughter came to me and said, Hey, Daddy, I'm facing a bully each day. I'm facing some strife and struggle on the block. Like, Things are difficult. I'm not going to ignore them. I'm going to come to their aid and attention to learn and listen to figure out what in the world's going on. And I want to be there to help facilitate and to love and to lead forward. Our brothers and sisters of color, they're our spiritual siblings. And we demonstrate how little we care when we don't listen and ignore and say there's no issue. We devalue them when we ignore them. We demonstrate that they're not credible when we just blow it off and say, yeah, whatever. God's positioned you and me like Esther to have challenging conversations, to be catalysts of change for the glory of God, not for some political movement, but for the kingdom of God. To seek justice, to love mercy, to walk humbly with the Lord. God's positioned you to illuminate the darkness, to light up the night with the gospel of Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit. And part of that is to listen, to see what's broken, 
to address those things, especially for those that are in positions where we can address things and change policy and change course and challenge thinking and challenge speech and stigmas. Let's value our brothers and sisters of color. Let's hear their cries and let's give credence to what they're saying. Let's value them as members of the kingdom of God and let's do something. Let's speak up. Let's pull together that the body of Christ may be more magnificent as God's intended it to be, more diverse, more united. Esther was an extension of the justice of God, and God ministers through the body of Christ. We're an extension of his love and his mercy and justice right here in 2020, not forever ago, centuries ago in this ancient empire, but now, today. And a lot of change came through this conversation Let's look back here at the end of verse 6. Esther said, A foe and an enemy, this wicked Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and the queen. Verse 7, And the king arose in his wrath from the wine drinking and went into the palace garden. But Haman stayed to beg for his life from Queen Esther, for he saw that harm was determined against him by the king. Light illuminates darkness. Good overcomes evil. Evil will be hidden for a while. You may get away with something, but ultimately there is a price to pay. It'll be exposed now when you'll have the chance for redemption and for mercy and restoration, reconciliation, for healing, for forgiveness, or you'll harbor it, you'll ignore Christ, reject Christ, move into eternity and and pay the consequence. And what we see is that Haman worked sin and what will come is that that sin that he worked led to death. He was found out. It was exposed. And sadly, he's begging for his life here, but you get the sense based on the verbiage here in the Hebrew that he's not really remorseful for what he's done. He's just remorseful that he got caught. He didn't want to change. I know how maddening that is. You have loved ones, friends that have been caught in something that clearly is evil. It's wrong. It's not in line with scripture. God just screaming like lovingly, like turn to me. There's a better life. There's a better way. You're settling for these other things that can't fulfill. You're you're doing things out in right field away from me, but there's a better way, a life-giving way. And you expose, you say, look, we love you. And because we love you, we're going to have a direct conversation. We're going to put it in writing and say, look, check this out. We love you and we want you to love God and follow him because he loves you and wants you to follow him. Like turn to God, find forgiveness, find life. And they're just like, yeah, but, but what I've done isn't really wrong, right? Like if it makes me feel good, if I think it's okay in my own eyes, like I can just walk out that way and do that thing. And you're just like, no, no, no. The God of the universe loves you and he's poured his heart and life out for you through God the Son on the cross. He rose for you so you can rise, have this resurrected life. And he poured his heart and soul into his word by the Spirit of God so you could know truth and live. And you are living in error. You're living in darkness. You're caught up in something that's not of God. And there's this whole sort of kingdom And there's this whole sort of paradise that can be now in the presence of God. And you're settling for the nasty, the things that won't fulfill you. And they're just like, no, I'm good. He didn't want to change. He just was remorseful that he got caught. He didn't want to be transformed or repent. He just didn't want to die. And so he pleaded for his life, but he just wanted to keep doing his thing. God confronts our sin, but he doesn't want you to keep doing your thing. He wants you to do the God thing, which is a great thing, and it's a good thing. It brings hope, and your your eyes just are opened, and your heart is softened, and you're just blown away at the majesty of God and how good he is and how a life tethered to him is really a life of freedom. Haman didn't want to change. He just didn't want to die. And he pleaded with Esther, but it was already determined by the king that you, you're toast, you're done. You have embarrassed me. You've defied me. You've defied my queen. And you are done. You need to hear this this morning, that the true king, Christ the king, forgives and restores every time. If you turn to him by faith, asking for forgiveness, acknowledging that you're a sinner, that you've been wrong, that you're in need of his forgiveness and in need of his life, he'll forgive you and save you. If you call upon the name of the Lord, you will be saved. 
you genuinely come for forgiveness and mercy, he hears those prayers, he hears those cries, and he'll restore you every time. He's not fickle like Xerxes. He's not vindictive like Xerxes. You know what the desire for you is from God is one of restoration in life. Listen to this from Acts chapter 28, verse 16. Excuse me, Acts 26, verse 18. Here Paul is retelling his commissioning, his calling, his purpose, his ministry from Christ. Christ says this, uh, I'll back up to verse 17, Acts 26, 17. Delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you. I'm sending you to the Gentiles. Look at this, this is so key. Here, this is the heart of God. Not just for people forever ago, but for you today, 2020. What is it? 8, 9, 2020. Look at this. I'm sending you to the Gentiles, Paul, to open their eyes so they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. Turn from evil power and darkness to me, the the power of God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins. In a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Listen, some of you may be caught up in some evil stuff, some nasty stuff. You may be running drugs. You may be sex trafficking. You may be murdered. Like, you are caught up in some things. Whatever sin you're caught up in, whatever thing you're harboring, whatever thing you've been working, know this, that the God of the universe desires justice and restoration for you. He desires reconciliation where you'd be right with Him. God's in the business of saving wretched sinners. And whether you murdered or you cheated on her taxes or cheated on her spouse or you just have been dis whatever it is, sin is sin to God. We put levels on it. There's consequences for sin within the judicial system. There's levels of evil that are punished with a greater penalty. I get that. But in the eyes of God, sin is sin. And we're all separated from God. But it's God's desire for you not to be separated from Him for an instant longer, but for you to be restored and given life through Christ so you could be right with Him. His desire is to lead you from darkness and corruption. His desire is to lead you from things that seem okay but are really not okay so you can have life, everlasting, joy-filled life. I plead with you today. I'm not trying to be a salesman, but I plead with you to contemplate your status and your eternal status. If you were to die today, would you go into paradise with the king of the universe? Are you right with God because you've surrendered to Jesus by faith? You've pleaded for forgiveness. You've placed faith in Jesus and now are entering little by little into a relationship with God. Have you done that by faith? If you can honestly say, like, no, I haven't. I haven't trusted Christ as Savior. I'm inviting you today. God desires for you not to perish, but for you to have life and have life abundantly. And true life is going to come in and through Jesus every time, hands down. There is no substitute. There is no other way. It's Christ the King. So I lovingly, I'm getting fired up. I lovingly plead with you to contemplate And maybe right now, just to surrender to Jesus, his desire is that you wouldn't die, but that you would live through his death and his resurrection. Jesus hung on a tree and his death brought life for countless people. Have you trusted in the master, the one who willingly, joyfully laid down his life for you to heal you and forgive you of all of the things that you're doing and all the things that you've done. I mean, the reality is, as we look at Esther, so often we right, we want to be the hero. We want to be the protagonist. And Mordecai and Esther didn't knock it out of the park. They weren't perfect. Sometimes we elevate them and we'll see and we'll highlight probably as we wrap up the study that they didn't knock it out of the park. They weren't, they weren't perfect. But we want to be the hero, right? We want to be Batman. We want to be Superman. We want to be Big Poppy back in the day, bases loaded, right? Two outs, bringing in those game-winning runs, right? Like, we want to be that guy or that gal. The reality is we're plagued by sin and corruption like Haman. And without the forgiveness of the living God, without his touch, without his love, without a faith that comes to him as a gift to us so we can receive the gospel, we're in huge trouble. But it's his desire to restore. And he'll redeem and restore you from 
all manner of things, all kinds of darkness. That's what he does. That's what he did for me. I was running far from the master, doing all kinds of just nonsensical things, evil things that, that God didn't design, that God wasn't for, he didn't condone. God of the universe just plucked me out of that. And he's been turning my life around little by little and changing me little by little. The people are different. The locations are different. The stories are different. But Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's a God that saves. Turn to Him today. Let Him lead you forward. Walk into real life, one that He establishes for you. Esther had a hard conversation. God used it for good. To go further, we see just the irony in that the gallows that Haman established for Mordecai were used to execute Haman. Sin leads to death and destruction every time. Christ leads to life and a future and a hope now and into eternity. God's positioned you to be an extension of His justice. He's sort of established you to be an extension of His light, to set a different rhythm in the workplace and in the family. And He's positioning us to have challenging conversations at times, not because we love to have them, not because they're easy, but they can lead to healing. They can lead to change. They can lead to breakthrough. They can lead to unity once again. A relationship that's gone south can be restored by the grace of God and the Spirit of God. And we look to Esther, and she was winsome, and she was calm, and she was clear, and she was descriptive and direct. She was honest. What's the one conversation you need to have? What's that one person you need to lovingly pull aside, establish a meeting with digitally or in person, just to work through some tension and misunderstanding? If you're uncertain or uncomfortable going in person, maybe you could put it in writing lovingly, sift it, read it, have a trusted sort of accountability partner read it over to make sure the tone is right and that it's fair. Maybe you need to address something in person and you follow Matthew 18 and you need to bring another brother or sister in or it's another family member just to sit down and have sort of difficult conversation. What's that conversation? Who's that person? Every time you do it, it's not easy, but it's a sign of love, a love for God and a love for others because it's your desire for something that's been broken to be healed, for the light of Christ and the love of Christ to illuminate something that's messed up. God's the God that takes the mess, the mess up, the things we've goofed up, and He's the one that smooths them out, refines them, brings life, brings healing, brings hope, and brings a future. Let's pray this morning. Father, we come before you today and we're grateful for your word. We're grateful that you are with us, that you've gone before us, you've gone behind us. God, your spirit is all over us. Your presence is all in and through us. And God, you're a God that desires to bring life, to bring hope, to bring healing. So thank you for that. Minister to your people today. And Father, as people tune in that maybe have not trusted in you, we just invite them to this moment to just say yes to you, to surrender to you as Lord and King. And I just invite those that are tuning in right now that haven't trusted you as Lord and Savior just to to pray with me and as we often say, this is not a magical moment, but it just it gives a time, stamp, time stamp and a time frame for that moment where God drew us to himself, that we would just know that on the ninth day of August 2020, I yielded to Christ by faith and became a follower of Christ. I became a child of God. So today, pray with me. Jesus, I acknowledge that I am a sinner. Jesus, I acknowledge that I need you, the Savior, the true Savior, the only Savior. I acknowledge that you died on the cross for my sins. I acknowledge that on the third day you rose from the dead. 
Forgive me of my sins. Take over my life. Teach me to follow you. For those of us that have been following Jesus, we just ask for your help, Lord, today, that your spirit, your word would direct us, that we would search our hearts for sin, that we would confess those areas to you regularly, asking for your help. Father, that we would address the injustices around us lovingly for your glory and the good of others, that we would have loving, difficult conversations for the good of our brothers and sisters and family members, Lord, that you would use us to advance your kingdom by your spirit and the gospel of Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Man, we appreciate you guys so much. Uh, Look forward to giving you guys some high fives, some pounds and hugs soon. Remember, join a group. There's opportunity to to be together for prayer, support now, starting here in the next couple weeks. New groups are forming, existing groups are reforming, Uh, and and also Wednesday, if you're able, starting this Wednesday at noon, we're going to have a noonday prayer every Wednesday, a time where we'll come here, mask up until things change, but to be in the same space, praying, seeking God's heart for one another, for the future of the ministry, for the future of the church in New England, and the future of the church global. So come Wednesday at noon for time of prayer and encouragement. We love you. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you soon. Bye.